Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another uh, post tweet jam discussion. I've got Wes on today. He was gracious enough. He's a regular. I was like that. It's a long time listener, first time caller to the yeah. post tweet jam. Uh, but Wes, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Wes Preston. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I think in my eleventh year um, for Share SharePoint. And uh, is it more than that? Twelfth. All right, twelfth year. Yeah. Time flies. That last year was kind of a blur. So, yeah. Um, yeah so mostly around SharePoint, uh, which kind of migrated, evolved into Office servers and services. And now I spend most of my time doing kind of the in between technology and business. So I spend a lot of time with the uh, Power Platform, with Lists, still um, independent consultant, working on a startup that has to do with all of that stuff, with managing tech skills. Um, platforms knowledge all that fun stuff i also and, organize the, i also organize and, the biggest event oh that's SharePoint. true yeah yep. twin city sharepoint saturday which recently renamed to m m365 uh twin cities nice i was going to throw in one other thing it's also co-authors of that oh my gosh if you are it, hot off the presses a few years back, but if you are dying for tips like solution guidance for SharePoint 2010, Wes and I Got can it. hook you up with the book. I, I, could, I could pull one off the shelf over there if you want me to. I, you know, mine's in a box over in that closet over there. <laughs> <laughs> mine's on the shelf right over there. So. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I used to have them. I had them out and all that <laughs> stuff, but, you know, it's a pain to dust all that stuff. I know. <laughs> You got to keep cleaning out the older ones too, and yeah. ours are kind of in that mode now. So, I have to say that one of my favorite things when we were running the uh, SharePoint Saturdays on Microsoft Campus back in the days when I had a purple badge, so it was a a vendor a partner badge for those that yep. first, the blue badge, orange badge, purple badge. Anyway, so I had access into Office Spaces, the access that's gone to the world now, unless you're a blue badge. Uh, and you would go into any of the little uh, 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 kitchen areas in just about any building, and you would find discarded books. It was kind of a service that Microsoft would provide to employees uh, that were on site there, and they would just get rid of their books and other tech gear in the kitchen area, and somebody would come and take it along, or anybody could grab it. We used to go and just grab like ancient technical books and then give them away as the raffle prices. <laughs> it was it was fantastic, except one time we were giving away something that was like like an ancient, I don't know, .NET or even pre-.NET, just something ancient technology book, and the author was in the audience. I was, was, waiting for, I was waiting for you to say that you came across a pile of our old books because they're discarded I, by the Microsoft folks. No, I'm not sure that any of the Microsoft people bought our books. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's probably that's, true. Yeah, but anyway. Well, listen, so the topic, this, uh, this last... Um, SharePoint, or this, the last SharePoint. See, I go that direction. The last Slab Talk Tweet Jam was improving productivity in the enterprise, and so we had a, a great turnout for that. And there was a lot of discussion, and it was it was kind of the uh, warm and fuzzy questions around this. And I was interested. They were meant to be broader, to, so that people can bring you know specific experiences to the space. And so I know that you know with with our history, with a lot of talk about improving collaboration and productivity in general that means we have a lot of those discussions where even you know in the sharepoint space how the discussion shifted as you saw broader and broader adoption reach of the platform for very technical keeping the servers up scripting building custom blah 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 to whatever that was up to now we're, we're really talking more about the business how do we keep people engaged what are these business scenarios how do we keep people happy and coming back and collaborating more? Because when more people collaborate, we get more out of the technology it, itself. That was kind of the basis of, of, this, of this topic. So let me start out. Question number one, what three things would have the greatest impact on enterprise productivity and why? And again, like you said, pretty darn broad. Um, I think my, I think my, during the tweet jam, I think my answer was was something like the people, the tools, and the leadership, um, mm -hmm. which leads into lots of other stuff, right? I mean, people is going to be making sure you've got the right skills there, making sure you've got the collaborative kind of personality, the, the right culture. 
Um, tools is obviously where we've been playing for years with SharePoint and now Teams and all of the other stuff in that period, periodic chart that, that someone got out there. Um, and then leadership, I always come back to leadership because they're the ones that are they're setting the vision and they're clearing the path, hopefully, for people to do their job and getting the right tools in and all that stuff. Um, but I mean, it's such a mishmash of so many different things, you know, with so many different variables. variables. Um, so we just come back to our, our old, it depends, you know. Yeah, it depends. Well, and that's, and I went with something similar. I think I talked about, you know, people, process, and technology being the three yeah. main plugs. But it's, it's kind of like, I'm a marketing guy and there, there's always talk about, you know, you adjust the marketing mix, the four P's or five P's, depending on which methodology, you know, and, and you, you're constantly fine tuning, just like in operations. You look at the metrics, you look at the scorecards, the KPIs, and you're constantly tuning. How do we improve? How do we improve? You know, you improve 20%. Now, how do we get another 5%? How do we keep moving forward? And you do that with that mix of people, process, and technology. Uh, and, and so there's always going to be just, you could have extremely happy people on far outdated technology and still be able to get process done and be successful, I would argue that you can have the top of line technology. And if your people aren't happy, it doesn't matter what yep. the technology is. It, it, it's, it's a failure. So I weigh it heavily on the people side, but all three of those are important. Yeah. And when we, I mean, when we, when I go into a place and, and I'm talking to people too, it's, it's a lot of, evaluating where the pain is at that particular time right the one and the one that neither of us spent too much time talking about there because it's it's the most painful one to talk about is sometimes you have the wrong leadership too um yep. and that's where you know i've seen people like the like the eos process and consultants on that side they tackle that heads on head on but yep. that's not typically something that you and i are going to go in and say hey the guy who hired me uh he stinks <laughs> So, right. But, that, yeah. but it's also or, it's very relevant. Or I was hired to work on the wrong problem entirely, and it just doesn't have yeah. the right scope. Yeah, you know, one of the great ex examples, I love this example, is very visible, um, very transparent, was back with the uh, with the Yammer acquisition when Nationwide was like the poster child for, for Yammer. But the story was of, so I think it was Nationwide Insurance that was there, and I, I, it, I don't remember if it was the CEO or there's somebody very senior in the org that was up on stage. I think that was the SharePoint conference that was in uh, Anaheim. I believe that was that. Okay. Anyway, if I have my dates wrong, my events wrong. But anyway, that in that example, it just talked about how uh, somebody very junior in the support organization had posted a question out on on Yammer and like nobody responded to it. And here the CEO, because it's so flat, the CEO went in saw the question, responded to it, and then immediately everybody's paying attention to that, and then it got hundreds of responses. And it was is used as an example of the power of what Yammer could do and the flat you know structure of it. So anybody that you know could provide feedback. That's all true, not to take away from that. Yep. However, it, it also shows the power of having executive support. People will follow and if an executive, the leadership team doesn't believe in the solution or, or you know have that out there it isn't using it especially if they disparage it in any way it, it's not going to be adopted and so it's it's critical for them to be out front yep absolutely agree it's so a common, it's, oh go ahead I was just gonna say it's a common conversation I have with people too because I'm usually at the at the team or like the platform ownership level and it's you know when we start talking about governance and lots of other topics it's do we have support from execs if not we're going to be fighting this uphill. Right. Sorry. That, that, that's that's some ways where as an independent, and you and I both had this experience, where you go in and say, like, oh, I delivered on what I was hired to go and do, and eh, I'm not interested in extending. I've got these other projects going on. Yeah. I'm not able to. Yep. Yeah, you, you recognize that hot mess right away. The second question kind of touches on the same thing. So because I asked the question, uh, it, it biased towards my response to the first question. But the second one, considering people, process, and technology, where's the focus of your org and and why? And so it could be like your think about you know you, some of your customers. Where is their focus, and why? It's a tough one to say, um, just because it. Uh, I've seen so many of them in there. Most of the time, when I'm getting engaged, the focus is on the technology, um, or at least they think it is. Um, and it'll slip into 
slip into or I might steer it towards the people part because they could they'll they'll come in and say hey I want you to make this techno I want this technology to do this and we'll we'll say hey let's take a step back and see what why are you doing that right what's the reason for it and I, I don't know what the odds are or what the percentages are but in many cases it's a it's a people problem not a technology problem or it's a technology problem where they have multiple answers for it and someone in the org has to decide which path they want to take. So, I mean, it's, it's tough, right? They, it's the, it's a, it's a very typical consulting problem where a consultant or, or a company is going to say, Hey, I want you to use this to solve this when that's really not the problem. Right. So, um, well, so were they, they, they try to be so prescriptive in nailing yeah. down, you know, uh, edge cases, um, that, you know, specific scenarios that they're solving for, and that really just has kind of a domino effect of then locking out other scenarios. Yep. And I know that there, there's the, I mean, there's a lot of fear and some of it justified of leaving the system wide open, turning all, flipping all switches, turning everything on, give everybody access and then just let it go. Yep. And that is fantastic for consultants to then come back in later and clean up all of the mess that's created there. Um, we just did, so I just did a survey and ask that exact question. Well, I asked the question, I'm looking at my results over here, saying, how do you characterize your organization's implementation? Are you bleeding edge? Are you letting everything tur get turned on? Are you spending time doing some, hey, let's check this out and, and roll it out with, you know, method. Piloting, yeah. With, with a method. I, yeah. And, or are you super conservative, right? You're gonna, hey, this new stuff is coming, let's see how everyone uses it before we turn it on. And it's about, 20% bleeding edge, which is kind of more than I thought there would be. Mm. Um, about half is where we like to see people, right? With the, oh, we're checking it out. We're trying to be methodical, but we're but we're using it. Mm -hmm. And then probably another 40% are doing the super conservative side. So I was, I was a little surprised at that. I was surprised that there were that many people doing the bleeding edge or what I would call bleeding edge. But really what I'm calling bleeding edge is what Microsoft is pushing hard, right? It's New features, we're turning them on by default, but you know, get them in the hands of your users, even if they're not technical. Like, oh, well, well, you know why? I mean, my, Microsoft, because they're all unhappy because they're all dog fooding and their stuff is constantly breaking because they, they have to do dog food. And so they want everybody else to be miserable too. <laughs> I'm just yeah, enjoy this food. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but, but it's yeah. different, right? It's, I mean, they are pushing stuff a lot harder than they have in the past. And, I understand some of the reasons why, and and but from our perspective as the people that are out there implementing and helping companies that are feeling the pain, there's there's pros and cons to that to that push, right? Well, yeah, it's it's the well, I mean, it's the one of the probably the most common question that people ask, like, how do you keep up? And the answer, I jokingly answer every time, but it's the truth. It's yeah, it's that I, well, I don't. Yep. And, and so I have certain uh, people, certain podcasts, certain blog posts that I follow up on. I'm, I'm reading through the message center updates to get the email notifications. I'm reading through those on a regular basis to try and you know catch up. And then immediately I reach, I, I look to other people to find out, okay, what do they say about this thing? Because I don't fully understand the impact of this. It feels like this could be an issue. And I'll wait for smarter people to respond that are in depth on security, for example, that that kind of stuff. So, you it, it is um, that's why you have to you know one you can't hide from it. You delay the responses. You could be on a slower ring. Um, it will catch up at some point. It, yeah. it you you still need to change the way that you're consuming and then training and updating your environment. Yeah. Your users. And I think a lot of it depends on it. This is this might be the next question, but it's I think it plays into the culture too, yeah. right? It's it depends on what the culture of your company is. There's there are going to be companies that fit in all three of those niches, and if they're if they're bringing on the technology that aligns with the way that their culture works, then it's great, yeah. right? But the, the, where we run into problems is where they do the mis the mismatch, right? You've got a conservative organization, and then you've got someone in IT who's like, bring on all the really cool new stuff and the rest of people are just tripping over themselves. So it's a matter of matching that stuff up, I think. And there's, and it is great that you can, again, you know, you know faster, slower rings for the new features and new capabilities. Um, but you can also be very conservative. Microsoft is getting better 
that not just releasing a new feature and having it by default on. I mean, they're they're thinking through in my again. Uh, they've always thought through some of it like, Hey, this needs to be here for this reason. They're doing a better job of communicating those things yep. and some of the impacts there. So yeah. So number three, question three was exactly that about culture. What role does culture play within enterprise productivity and how does an org build and maintain a strong culture? And it's in, in relation to collaboration and productivity, not just culture generically of the organization. Right. Although it's just uh, you know an aspect, it's a subfolder, or uh, of of the broader culture. Yeah. Yeah. So I and I think I said this on the when we were on the actual tweet jam too. It's like culture is, it's such a it's such a buzzword, right? And it means so many different things. But it comes to what we've just been talking about a lot, and it's how how people are flexible and accommodating. And I think this is where over the past, I don't know how many years we've been talking about this, but where where like the user adoption thing all of a sudden got to be super important. And, you know, we spent a lot of time on it for good reason. It was how do different organizations accommodate that user adoption? Because it was, I would say traditionally, IT was shoving tools down the business's throat. Well, yeah. And Microsoft didn't care about it. And there was there was a turnaround. And I'll, for those that don't know some of the history, I mean, exactly why it happened the way that it happened is because when Microsoft started, uh, when they rebranded uh, MMS to BPOS to Office 365 and launched Office 365, they were still, as a company, Microsoft was pushing out through enterprise agreements. And what was happening is the end of those EAs people were not renewing a bunch of these components. And why? Because they realized they were paying for something that they weren't getting the broad adoption across the organization. And so suddenly, you know, those of us that were in the community, especially that were just shouting this from the rooftops, trying to, saying, you know, adoption is everything. Mm -hmm. You know, if people aren't using it, they're not going to keep paying for it. Duh. Um, well, that finally it clicked and it worked its way into the KPIs, uh, the, the the measurements uh, for the salespeople, the sellers within Microsoft, and that's what moved things around. Well, then uh, an effect of that happened where it then got then Microsoft people thinking, well, how do we improve adoption? How do we have a stained adoption and ongoing adoption, get them in, plugged in, up to speed, they know how to use it and long-term engagement, which is the ongoing activity and, and more activity, how do we increase that? Because we know that the more engaged people are, the more productive they are, the more benefits that they get out of the solutions that they have, and the more likely that they'll be happy with the solutions themselves and yeah. feel like getting their money's worth. So it's all tied in there. If, you know, a, a lot of times from a cultural standpoint, my experience is just that there's an executive, back to that, uh, an executive or two who get it, who get it and understand that we don't always have the exact measurement for the result of this thing, but more people talking together, working and sharing information is better for us, even though we don't know the attribution of a lot of this is hard to do. Yeah. And I think I, I'm probably biased in my opinion. I think the community was probably a half step ahead of Microsoft in terms of recognizing that 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 user adoption was important and it was hey instead of just turning these things on or or making them available or an executive you know declaring we're going to we're going to use this tool it was we need to spend some time working with the people that are going to use these tools and show them why it's important or show them why it's you know easy or beneficial or show them what the value is and once they bought into that once we I don't want to say coddled is not the right word, but once we kind of nudged them down that path and, and kind of gave them that message and they bought into it, user adoption became super easy, right? And in the past, it was really like, turn it on. Here's a new tool. Learn how to use it. Here's a training thing. People are like, I got work to do. I'm not going to go do this or spend any time on it. But once we started explaining to them that there was value, then they're like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Let me start using it. So that's I think there was a change there a little ahead of where Microsoft started to get into it. Now, thankfully, I, I'm super excited with all the resources we have from Microsoft now with the, the different sites, with the roadmap messaging, with the message center messaging. I mean, all of that stuff is is fantastic. And I think 
way ahead of other organizations or other you know service providers. So it's it's an exciting place to be. That's a great segue into the next question, which I think touches on it. It almost like kind of bridges between you know the culture down into now that the practice, the change management aspect of it. Um, so focusing on technology, how do you or your organization approach productivity improvements? So I think you name some of those tools, watching those things. So it's, you know, you've got the listeners that are out there so that you can actually follow and filter on the roadmap site, for example, uh, and you get more data about which which uh, changes, which roadmap items actually impact uh, your tenant yep. um, and be able to follow those things along and subscribe to, you know, uh, uh, or you know, follow those items so that you get the updates instantly when changes happen to the roadmap, for example. Yep. And I think that I was really excited about the message center and how they, um, so like when I think of message center, I think traditionally of an IT pro type of person that's managing or, or monitoring that it's generally not the user base, right. um, but bringing it when they, when they set up that link between uh, message center and planner, um, and with all of the other automation tools that we have available to us now, um, now we can now we can see that stuff as it comes down. We can say here here are my different platforms or my platform owners. It's coming, you know. There's something from Message Center that's about that plant platform, and I can route it to them and stick it in front yep. of their face. That is awesome. It's it sometimes it's like the you have to you still have to do some tweaking and filtering on it, but. If we can get that stuff that's coming down and get it in the in front of the people that need to see it, that's super exciting from a governance perspective. Well, it is something too. That's a great point. That it's it's much more you know public facing out there. So if the admin admin team has somebody who is a, a power user that is very passionate about a solution we're world waiting for an update from Microsoft on. You can point them towards that. They can watch that in real time. It's a great accountability tool so that when it does ticks over, you know, they are watching it at, you know, 12.01 a.m. They're aware that the change took effect and they can harass you then internally about, hey, when are we going to get it? When are we going to get it? It's now live out there. And, of course, then you have to go back and explain the whole concept of, of rings and <laughs> where you are as an org to get it. That's why I love, you know, some of the changes it, 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 and uh, – one of the asks that I've, that's been out there for a long time is in the message center updates and the roadmap, don't just tell me what's available out there, even that is now rolling out. Don't tell me about it or or highlight it, flag it somehow when it's actually touched my tenant. I would love that capability. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, but that is something that is great. You have a lot more insight into what's happening um, than we've ever had before. Yep. And I think it's I think back to eons ago when I worked for Target Corporations IT and we were on, you know, we had a I can't remember what the group was called, but it was part of the change management group, right? So it would it would be get all the platform owners in a room and if this technology had a change coming, then the rest of us could go, eh, that doesn't touch me. Or oh crap, that's gonna really, you know, impact my group. That was the meeting where all of those conversations happened. You know, if we if we had that evaluation, you know, somewhat automated through this process, that was that'd be super powerful, right? If I can sit there and say, you know, look at the list of things that are coming, and and before that meeting or as part of a different process, I can go, no, 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 oop, that's one I'm going to have to spend some time researching. Super, super effective, and that's that was from the IT pro side, right? That's like, oh my gosh, it's going to affect my server. That so many of those things that come down trickle right down into the users, and that that would give those platform owners time to say, "All right, this new change is coming." And if it's you know it could be message center, it could be roadmap. Um, either way, it gives us time to say, "All right, here's something that's coming. Here's my communication plan. Here's my training plan. Here's my whatever to make sure that everyone's ready for it." Or um, you know we're not we know we're not ready for it. So what are we going to do about it? Right. And it's all of these things that Microsoft is giving us from that perspective has been great from a communication and adoption and governance perspective. You know, early in my career, what this reminds me of, uh, early in my career, and I started out as a business analyst and then a technical project manager, and that was my world for the first decade of my 30 years. And 
uh, you know, in, in that world was around change management. And a lot of the, you know, desktop management in the old way, a lot of it on-prem, all of that, but all the server management, all of those solutions and the way that they would go and and deploy, you know, uh, uh, desktops and laptops and all that and own all these systems and tools. But you had, you know, a centralized team that owned all of that and would then create the communications, the training schedule and all of that. And I think we're we're starting to see organizations are getting better and figuring out how to do that again. Yeah. And and it was it was lost for a while. And a lot of organizations, even especially if they moved most of their systems to cloud services, did away with those teams. They're like, oh, we're consuming a service here and stuff. It's like, yeah, but no, you still <laughs> need to have that. Yeah. You know, like, especially if you have if you are using any of the tele- telephony capabilities, like you need to have a dedicated person who's smarter than all of us that knows a bunch of those things because none of them works seamlessly. Mm-hmm. And don't anybody send me angry emails, that, you know, that, that there's like, I'm sorry, no, you're blind to all of the issues that still happen around the telephony side of things, especially, yeah. yeah. But uh, especially about teams, I know that works flawlessly. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I would I would argue that those teams are are more relevant now just because of the speed of change right. is, right. you know, the more the more of those cloud, the more cloud based services that you use, the more you're using stuff that changes so fast that you have to have someone paying attention to it all the time. That's, this goes back to the conversation that we were having years ago as the cloud started entering the conversation. So back in 2014, 2015 of like what happens to the IT pro? Like what happens to that role? And and we would say all the time. In fact, I did a session at the first, uh, 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 the Ignite, when it got re- Tech Ed moved to Ignite and it was the Chicago event. So when was that? Five, six years ago? I'll say five, so but I, yeah. So I did a session. It was packed. There was like 1,500 people in the session on, uh, on you know, what happens to that role. And where I went and did you know survey to the community and got feedback. So it was an hour of me going through and sharing data from Microsoft as well as sound bites from various MVPs and experts and vendors and and partners that are out there. And the 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 message overwhelmingly was the role doesn't go away, the need doesn't go away. It changes yeah. for sure. But you need to have people that understand the systems, that understand what's happening behind the scenes of how the services are consuming data, how they're connected, and that when stuff goes wrong, like how you're going and and uh, doing the root cause analysis became more difficult when you don't own the servers and you're having to go to Microsoft for that, for that frontier. Yeah. So speaking of having to go to Microsoft to solve problems, describe your greatest productivity blunder <laughs> and how you hopefully turned it around. I can't think of what you'd like to share. Yeah, well, I, I can't think of a specific like, oops, I did something horrible. I, honestly, to me, it was it's to me, it's being able to filter out and manage all the social media distractions. So that's and that to me is an ongoing challenge, um, partially because it's well, there's just so much crap out there, um, but it's. People will say the easiest, oh, just turn it off. Like, well, yeah, that's easy, but there's, I have a lot of community things that happen through those, through those, uh, those channels where I have to be able to, I shouldn't say have to, it's helpful to me to be able to see some of that stuff. So my challenge is partially, partially discipline and partially using tools to filter things down into the stuff that I need to see during the day and leaving all the family and personal stuff to, you know, other times. Um, but that's, I'm easily distracted. So that to me has been probably my biggest, I wouldn't call it a blunder, but I would call it a challenge from a productivity perspective. Well, sometime when we're sitting down in person, I'll tell you, uh, my adventures at a past company where, uh, it was uh, a problem that came up with somebody falsifying test data results, test results. And, uh, that caused some problems, the failed go live of a major system, uh, yeah. So, uh, but but that again, that wasn't a uh, wasn't a blunder, other than uh, you know a, a a deceitful employee who got reported to the authorities. Oh. But, uh, yeah. But anyway, that was what came to mind first. But I think most of 
you know, my my first thought. Oh, that's my first thought. The second thought around that was uh, was I think being uh, overly optimistic about some of the technology, and especially when it's brand new and wasn't fully vetted. Yeah. And so, I mean, even Microsoft has pulled back on new features. They've released things, you know, and then gone back and changed. And I. You know, and for the people that 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 moan and complain about when Microsoft, oh, they just they just released it a month ago. What are they doing? I'm like, I'm glad to hear of those examples where the feedback is overwhelming, like that didn't it didn't land as intended, or they didn't foresee this scenario, or you know something else, and Microsoft then brought it back in. Like that's part of that what needs to be there, the dynamic nature of these cloud services is that fast respond time to be able to go and fix things. Yep. And it's the, the nice part of that whole thing is that it's it's pretty rare that that happens and it has right. to be a pretty significant deal for them to do it. But I'm glad that they do it too. Yep. Uh, it's, it it's might happened, be painful, yeah. but it it's all the communication, last, right? Exactly. Last the last 12 calendar months, I think twice I've seen that happen. Maybe a third time, but twice that I'm I'm confident. Yeah. All right, so the next question, number six, within the Microsoft ecosystem, where can customers get the most bang for the buck in enterprise productivity? Well, I think the easy slam dunk is Teams right now, right? And it's 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 hard to, it's hard to- for That the was the setup I cast out, I reeled yeah. it back into everybody, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I would say had it not been for the for the the COVID situation, it might have taken longer for teams to roll out. But I mean, even before then, teams it was still ramping. It yeah. was still ramping hard. I mean, it yeah. it worked, right? It, I, I look at it again from a bias of our our long history with Microsoft. Is um, I, I look at it as a taking over a lot of the space that SharePoint used to have, or that SharePoint was pitched to have. Um, but it does a better, I think it does a better job of fitting with that collaborative space. You know, when we when we talked about team sites way back when, um, Teams now fits that bill even better than SharePoint did. Well, it's interesting that, you know, you had with back in the SharePoint as a uh, Swiss Army knife, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, organizations were trying to make it the one-stop shop for everything. Yep. And the idea was, and, and I even heard people saying that, that, well, let me back up. There's a there's a whole slate of vendors that are called these intranet in a box solution providers that were, you know, their their goal was to put a pretty face on top of SharePoint on the back end. That's yep. where that all came from. And teams mixed that up a bit for them. I, I think um be bewildering to uh, Microsoft leadership. In fact, I interviewed Teeper, Jeff Teeper specifically about this, where he said he was surprised of the resilience of the internet in a box providers and that they've only grown. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the a vendor out of uh, Clearbox Consulting, not Clearbox, um, who does uh, out of the UK, um, uh, so the team that does the, the internet in a box report, Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, so their analysis, they they have, there's over 50 solutions that are included within that report. There are okay. others that are not included. There's a lot of them out there and they're growing and some of them are doing very well. Now, I'm not close. I don't have any vested interest in any of them, but uh, I think some are also struggling and that's just the natural, there are better yeah. solutions than, than some that are out there. But the fact that they have remained you know, and, and you know, points to the need that people wanted to have a a nice business front end on top of, of SharePoint. Teams has, I have to believe, closing the window on a lot of those providers because it's providing a lot of the capability that that those orgs wanted. I'd say yes and no. So to when I think when I think of SharePoint. The historic SharePoint. I think of man, historic. That's almost worse than modern, isn't it? It's. Yeah. I, I always thought of three different things. I thought of the internet, right? The pushing to everybody. I thought of team sites, which is where yep. I think the the big landing zone for teams is, and right. then solution sites, which is really falling into the uh, the, the power platform side now. Right. So I, I need to build a solution that's you know I go that path. I think the in, I think the intranet one is still 
still that's the in number the one pressure. right yeah, yeah it's it's still there document so collaboration I mean, and intranet that's the core strength of right yeah but the collab i think the collab from sharepoint from the collaboration perspective is it's still there and it's still super powerful but it's really falling to more of a behind the scenes functionality because it's got all these other tools on top of it where SharePoint's the core, so it doesn't get all the fanfare, but it's still it's still the core technology behind all those collaboration things. Intranet is really the, I don't wanna say the last, but it's really the big, you know, and when you say SharePoint, this is the big thing that's front and center that says SharePoint all over it, right? It's still intranets. So that, I, that might be why there's so many of those out of the box providers that are still there, but Right. And and well, that's the other thing, too, is that uh, you know, a lot of especially smaller. What's also happening is you, you have business trending and expansion is happening more rapidly within the SMC, which is a small to medium business and traditional Microsoft term corporate, which is the mid market. Yep. So kind of everything under the enterprise, which, again, traditionally was, you know, like 5000 seats and above wherever that is, the yep. enterprise. If you got four thousand nine hundred ninety nine, I'm sorry, you're not an enterprise. You're no, yeah. Um, but you have uh, you know so much growth that's happening there because of teams. Because for a lot of organizations that said we don't have the the people, the knowledge, or the time to go and build and maintain a SharePoint uh, formal intranet, we'd love to have that capability. And there used to be back in the WSS days, there was the small business server solutions and things oh. that were out there. Yep. Yeah, the Fab 40 and all that kind of stuff that was built around it to make it easier for smaller organizations to be able to go and out of the box do these things. Teams does that out of the box and provides yep. a lot of that where a lot of organizations say we don't need a formal intranet. But for those that do recognize in the, the difference and need to have the different things, my company, AppPoint, we have our intranet. We have Yammer that's side by side with that. We have, and then we have Teams, and they're very distinct scenarios. Yep. And I'm in all three every day, you know. And so it's that's that's part of the evolution there is that it's um, you know, you have used the right tools for the right problems, rather which, than which is a huge topic in our community right now, right? That's it's. It used to be like you you said a couple of times before before that SharePoint was this big, you know, do everything uh, umbrella, and it's really been kind of parsed out and split out into all the separate tools now. But it's, I, I and I made reference to that uh, periodic chart, right, of Office or whatever. It's I, I don't remember the original the right name for it, but that illustration is so powerful from from the things that we have to communicate. It's. You don't need to know SharePoint anymore. You need to be aware of that entire chart and all Let's, the tools that are there. I love pointing people to that. Matt Wade did such yeah. a great job of that. So if you don't know what we're talking about, go search on Matt Wade periodic table. It's a fantastic utility. Awesome. There's a few others that have all been lesser of his work on the periodic table. All good work, Matt. Love it. <laughs> you know? But that one is the rock star status one. But it's a great guide. Um you know, Microsoft never created something that that uh, useful, that functional. <laughs> All right, last question here, Wes. Uh, in your opinion, where should Microsoft be investing to improve enterprise productivity, or are they making the right investments? Hmm. I'm trying to remember what I said to that in, during the tweet jam, but it's a lot, I, a lot of it was around the the uh, uh, around the Power Platform. I think a lot of the commentary. I well, and it, I think. I think the plat the power platform is going to play a huge part because it's it's kind of that third I don't know third piece of what I was saying right it's the internet it's the teams collaboration and it's the solution building um, and that's where I spend a lot of my time so I'm biased in, in terms of that I would but, add the fourth leg of community but that's me you know well community kind of sits on top of all of that right it's it's being, yeah but from well, a tool standpoint yeah I, yeah I, know. I see what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah. To me, community falls into that that first the first one the intra the well the intranet the Yammer piece kind of the when you're talking about a community within an org when you're talking about community of you know all the people supporting the Microsoft platform those are two separate things but I, um, I didn't mean to get into a religious discussion about Yammer but uh, yeah well but anyway you know what I mean so. I know what you mean <laughs> um, honestly. I think they're doing an awesome job right now when it comes to things like pushing out, how do I use this? What's the benefit of this? What, you know, when do I use this? I think there's a, a great 
start. I think we've mentioned a lot of the different tools that I'm excited about, things like the, the message center and the, uh, the roadmap piece and then learning uh, the learnings site. Um, those are all awesome. And I think those are, you know, above what other providers are, are, are providing for their, their user bases. Um, but I think they need to keep going down there, right? Because the minute they stop, then they're behind and everyone else is kind of messed up too. So they have to, they have to keep doing that in, in terms of keeping up the communication to us. And when I say us, there's all these different audiences they still have to be able to understand, right? There's users, there's power users, there's citizen developers, IT pros, developers, like all of those people. And we need to keep getting content for all of us. And it's, that's tough. That's, I remember when, when we've been to some of our summits where we're at, you know, at Microsoft and we're talking, we would, it would usually be over a lunch session where they would bring in the people that are creating all the content and to ask us how they were doing. That's not a big team. You know, there's, there's just, there's not enough people providing that information to keep up with all the, the rate of change. And they do lean on the, they do lean on the community as a whole. They're doing a better a job at that, reaching out and having people that don't know too, a lot of content. Increasingly, you see out on Microsoft uh, Docs um, mm -hmm. uh, are, are community authored. That's a great, so I, that was a great move fantastic. when they did that. Yep. So, I mean, that's to me, that's a big thing. I think it's it's still going down the Teams route. It's still keeping down the, the Power Platform route. Um, the, my biggest concern with the, the Power Platform route right now is that I think they're still trying to find their way from a how do we pay for this and it and it changes yep. a little faster than people are comfortable with or can figure out and licensing already within what the you know the space that we work in is already a headache. It, there's everyone is always like oh licensing I'm not even going to address that because yeah. it's you have, such have a PhD point. in licensing to understand it. Yeah. And, and I think the power platform is is trying to they're it sounds it sounds bad, but I don't mean it to sound bad. They're earlier in the maturity cycle to figure they're still figuring that out. Um, they would be the first to say that. I mean, they, the Microsoft has been open about that. Um, you know, when they did the first change that caused such a, you know, a scuttlebug out there um yep. yeah a lot of frustration out there and, and microsoft said look we're, we're adjusting we're you know they they look they're they're a company that's in business to be in business they're not they can't be losing money on something and they're yep. based on the usage patterns and 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 so it's just evolving and changing so i expect it to evolve and change more yeah. but i'm surprised that one um one new offering that you didn't mention here at all and this entire time we've been talking uh, around Viva. And the reason I bring that up about investing more in, in, from a productivity standpoint, and not that Viva and the four offerings within that are the end all be all. And it's, it's, a, yep. it's a skew to some degree. There's new capability. There's different pieces that they branded under one piece. For the purpose of, you know, it, it's why most people identified and said, really what Microsoft did is they came out with an offering for HR that identified people recognize that why are they saying it why are they describing it in that way because what it is it's capturing experiences and data that are relevant to the how people are using the technology that they already own and better understanding and learning from you know the way the the patterns of collaboration today I guess I'm interested in this. I'm excited about this because I, I think you, you, uh, you probably heard me say this before, but I actually was on the path, was actually registered, was going to go start on my doctoral program, was going to look at the social informatics around collaboration technology. Yeah. I was specifically going to study how collaboration technology is changing how we collaborate. Yep. Team-based collaboration. So I'm very passionate about this topic. So very excited when they announced this piece. I said, finally, I mean, we've had insights and other analytics and pieces around that kind of skirted around that, but this is like next level up. Not that it's, again, it's not, it's, this is, we're, we're in the piloting of the beta of, of yeah. these, these offerings. Um, they are in no way finished products and go yep. talk to the teams, which were part of the alphas or betas that were early testers piloting out of capabilities. And that will tell you long way to go, but Microsoft is directionally correct. And like, Hey, we need to 
have this data. I'm excited about that. About VB. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the potential for it, right? I'm, I'm still on the, um, let's wait and see what actually comes out and what actually gets delivered and when it gets delivered. So, I mean, I'm a little hesitant to be, you know, rah, rah. Um, I think it's, I think it's super powerful. I think, I mean, it, it overlaps with it. it it's got a, it's got an overlap with the with my startup concept stuff. So I understand the space and I'm I'm excited about that space. But I also think that it's um, it's harder to deliver that message of what the value is to the masses, right? I think people that are thinking more at the management level are going to see this, the, see the offerings, and be excited about it because that's where they spend a lot of their time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a different it's a different audience to be message uh, to to put the message out to, and it's like you said, it's still it's still being refined, developed, all of that stuff. So I'm I'm excited about a lot of the concepts of it, but I'm also hesitant because I'm waiting to see how it actually gets delivered, and um, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how they mess the messaging for it because it's going to be. It's not a, oh, you can do this better kind of message. It's it's you have to really walk someone down that path for them to go, oh yeah, crap, that's really awesome. Let's bring it on. You know, it's a it's a little bit harder message to deliver, but there's so much value there. Well, I like that that it's it, it, you know to start utilizing the pieces that are out there today. Yep. I mean, there there's some setup. I'm actually doing a session tomorrow on preparing for Viva and what's kind of unique for for each one of those. And there's still a lot that we don't know, but you know, so there's yeah. kind of general things to go and prepare for around that. But um, it, you know, the the fact that there are there's community building around this and asking questions. The fact that it uh, if you're already using the out of the box capabilities you have most of what you need for it. It's not like I need to go and purchase E5 and a bunch of other tools and do a bunch of custom development to get it to a place where I can start utilizing these things. It's yep. going to be much more streamlined and, and plug and play. <laughs> to, you know how I use that that phrase, but um, into for those organizations that are interested in it. So yep. you're not being forced to go and use it. Like you can still do analytics at a bunch of different personal and workplace analytics and do each of those pieces. Or you can do it more comprehensively, you know, once insights is de deployed more broadly. Um, but uh, yeah, so you, when you have a, a, a you, you you could still have your learning, you know, uh, uh, paths in place uh, in your environment. But if you want to be able to track and measure your your uh, enterprise learning and the the uh, uh, the, the learning paths inside your organization track that like then there's a benefit for stepping up to that next yep. that next piece and they all you know intertwine and they're they are, they're all related to each other so um anyway that's uh, i know there's a lot we could talk just on that one topic yep but um Wes, really appreciate your time going through and uh, again as always participating in so many of the uh the tweet jams we get another one coming up this month June. i know I love them. I'm glad. Thanks for hosting those because I I just uh, I get jazzed doing them. You know, it's it's fun to answer. It's fun to see. It's fun to see what other people are seeing and kind of the different perspectives and just kind of letting that roll on 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 top of each other. I love it. I agree. It's uh, especially if you blog, if you if you speak and things, it, it just to get other people's perspectives. And and same same as you. Like I'm I'm often. In fact, I don't think there's a single SharePoint. Uh, see, I used the word SharePoint again. A single Cloud Talk Tweet Jam, where I've not ha seen a response that was the opposite of what my default answer was, mm -hmm. and made me kind of go, "Hmm, well, that's that's interesting. I didn't think about that." Like every single time, I get those kinds of responses. So it's it's great to go and see that. Of course, those are sponsored by um, by Tigraph that provides the tooling and measures that, and AppPoint, my uh, you know my sponsor here for this the event. But Wes, people want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. How can they find you? Um, they can find me on Twitter at um, at IDubs, I-D-U-B-B-S. They can find me at the same name, www.idubs.com. Um, those are probably the two easiest, you know, community ways of getting getting to me. Um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Those are the easiest ones. And if so, he's he's out there. He's a he's an overpriced um, high end consultant. So if you want his uh, <laughs> very reasonably priced people, come on. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. So uh, if you if you like what something that he, that he said, hire him. So let me know. Yeah, Wes, uh, appreciate it. And I'm going to see you at the end of the month. I will be in your neck of the woods driving out. Woo-hoo. So going to make that, uh, I don't know how, what is it, a 19-hour drive or something like that from, uh, from Salt Lake place. City to go into, how do you pronounce it? Otswego? Otswego? Otsego? Otsego? Otsego. There you go. Otsego. That's where I'm going. Minnesota, the land of Native American names. We have plenty. That's right. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot. And we'll, uh, we'll talk Thank to you, you soon. All right, take care.